right, welcome everyone. This is lecture number six in our Old Testament survey. And uh, we're right in the prophetic books. We have several more prophets to study. And uh, we also have some catch-up to do. We didn't do Ezekiel last week, and we're going to start there this evening. But part of uh, what we are going to do tonight includes Daniel. And so by way of a very brief devotion, I would like to introduce you to Daniel and his background. We're going to do a bit more of that when we get to the book. But in Daniel, we read Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. I trust that even as I read that little introduction, that you're in a far better position to actually make the connections, to connect the dots. And we're talking fall of Jerusalem. This is slightly before the fall of Jerusalem. Jehoiakim, one of the last kings of Judah, uh, and Nebuchadnezzar, who is the general who became a king for Babylon, etc., etc. When you, when you start connecting the dots and you read that information, then you have a fair idea of when Daniel lived. And also, as you continue now, you can sort of fill in that picture. And it says, And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. I, I want to stop there and just explain something which is part of the background that you may miss unless you really know that bit of background. You may remember the story of the Philistines and the Israelites in a battle and the ark is brought to help them during the time of Samuel and Eli uh, is um, just about to die. He's a very old man. The Philistines uh, won the battle and they captured, they took the ark of the covenant. The first thing they do is take it back home and put it in the temple, the temple of Dagon, their God. Part of that is an exercise to say, my God, our God, is stronger than your God, so your articles, whatever you regard as holy, those things are now in our temple because our God is stronger than your God. You can see how some of the Jews obviously battled with this whole issue of the Lord slowly but surely allowing Jerusalem to be uh, captured. In this particular case, Jerusalem has not been destroyed yet, so it's prior to that. But still, uh, Nebuchadnezzar came into the city, into the temple, and took many of those temple artifacts and articles, and he took it back to his God, his temple, in order to uh, say, my God was stronger than your God. Your God was not able to protect you. Um, that's the sort of essential message you get over here. Um, and then some of the people who were also taken into captivity. And instead of putting them in your, temp in your temple, uh, they did what, what Nebuchadnezzar did to Daniel and his friends and many other young people probably from around the world, uh, from around the empire where he captured them. Uh, in verse 3, Then the king ordered Aspenaz, king, a chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. It's important to note that Daniel was therefore of nobility. He was maybe even in the royal family, maybe one of the princes or maybe a priest or something like that at least. But he was certainly a well-to-do member of his society back home. And again, one of the statements you want to make is that as a leader, as King Nebuchadnezzar, I am strong and therefore I can take your royalty and let them serve me in my court. So it's a statement that you make. And that's precisely part of the background over here. These young men uh, were to be without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Then they were going to be taught the language and some skills, the know-how of the temple of Babylon, and, and all of those things so that they could serve the king. They weren't exactly prisoners, like walking around in chains or uh, something like that, but they, they, were still, um, they were still limited in terms of their movement, and they were supposed to serve the king. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And then they, have a, they had a change of name. And then 
this verse that I want to share with you. This all of what I read so far as part of the background. But verse 8 says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. So it seems like fairly early Daniel won the favor of this particular official, uh, Ashpenaz. And Daniel went about this in a very wise way, which is why he is also called a wise person. Uh, Daniel then said to the guard, uh, whom the official had appointed over them, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. And obviously God was behind all of this. So at the end of that particular period, Daniel and his friends looked extremely healthy. Um, and they didn't defile themselves with the food. One should never read into this but that we shouldn't eat meat or become vegetarian or anything like that. That is a personal choice. It's uh, anybody's choice. Uh, I personally eat meat and love it too. Uh, I don't know how you bry vegetables at a bry, but that's another story. Um, I, I don't think we should read into this. I think we should read into this the fact that Daniel believed that the food coming from the palace uh, was not kosher. And therefore, he decided not to uh, offend God or to step outside of the law of God. And, and therefore, uh, he asked for permission to eat only vegetables. And that leads to the rest of the story. Um, it, it's an amazing story when you really come to think of it. You have a young man who is essentially a prisoner. As I said, not walking around with chains or anything like that, but, but he still... Uh, confined. He's confined to Babylon. He is thousands of miles away, thousands of miles away from home. He could have probably done anything. He could have enjoyed palace life uh, in the in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar. He could have eaten anything. He could have lived any kind of life. But in Daniel's mind, there was a, an accountability towards God, and it wasn't the fact that he was outside of Jerusalem. Uh, far away from probably other family members who could have kept an eye on him. Uh, in fact, the, the, the narrow accountability structure was gone. There were no priests, there was no temple to actually guard him and ask him, how did you do and what did you eat and are you doing this, that and the other. So those legalistic requirements were gone. But deep down in Daniel's heart was a resolve. The resolve was to serve God. And that's a question, that's a challenge for me personally especially in my own life when I think about those moments that I am alone, where, where it's just God and me, and how do I behave? And I must say that I have, I have disappointed God many times, where I had to go back and say, Lord, I repent, because um, there's nobody else to watch me. Uh, and if I live my life only because there's a public eye or a parent or a family member who's watching me, I'm only serving God as long as other people watch me, uh, then I think it's futile. My service of God should be a matter of personal resolve where it doesn't matter where I am, where I'm on an overseas trip where nobody is seeing me, I'm away from my family uh, or from anybody else or the congregation. It's there that I believe it actually really counts because there one can make a difference in your faith. And as a result of that, Daniel served God not only while he was a young man, but he became an old man in this very same court, right throughout the Babylonian Empire uh, and all the way into the early part of the Persian Empire. Uh, Daniel was there serving the king, serving a foreign king, but serving ultimately the king of kings. But by serving Nebuchadnezzar or whoever else was on the throne, Daniel in his mind was serving God. And even when there were threats against his life, like the, uh, we know the story of the, uh, the lion's den so well, even there I find a very interesting comment. Uh, Daniel uh, heard that the king said, everybody must only pray to the king. And then it, there's a little comment that says, and Daniel went to his room and he prayed three times a day as was his custom or his habit. Uh, it wasn't a sudden thing. He wasn't rushing into his room because he heard that there was some kind of a crisis. It was part of a lifestyle. And uh, that really is a challenge to me.
in terms of how I serve God? Is it a lifestyle or is it something I do when it's convenient or when the pressure is on? Oh, Lord, help me sort of attitude uh, when I'm in trouble. Um, I believe that's one of the things we can learn from Daniel. Some of the jewels in the Old Testament prophetic books, I know it's probably one of the books that we know better than most of the others, especially the first half of the book, which is more narrative style, telling the story of Daniel and some of his friends in a foreign court. Let's pray together and then we'll hit the road as we get into the lecture for today. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us, for the way that you provide for us, that we are here in a warm room tonight. Uh, while it is cold outside, we pray that you would um, help us to be grateful to you. We are grateful especially, Lord, because you've given us your word, the Bible. We thank you that you have left it uh, to us so that we can read it even in our own language, so that we can understand who you are, the way you work, uh, the way that you have revealed yourself to us. We thank you for the prophetic literature in the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes not easy to read and to understand, but Thank you, Lord, that you give us your word and the prophets uh, to show us uh, the way to yourself. And especially as you prepared the way for the coming of Jesus Christ back in those days. Thank you that Jesus came and that we can live as a result uh, of your coming, that we can have a relationship with you. Help us to be like a Daniel and to live for you every single day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last time we looked at prophecy in general. And um, we looked at the writing prophets, uh, uh, we looked at Isaiah, Jeremiah, and we also looked at the book of Lamentations. Uh, Lamentations being uh, the lament over the fall of Jerusalem. And then we ran out of time and we didn't do Ezekiel, so tonight we'll pick up on Ezekiel once again. Uh, I want to say what I said several times now, and that is that we cannot really understand the prophetic literature unless you understand the background, the historical background, the geographical situation uh, of those prophets. And there's a lot in the prophets, in the prophetic literature, that we uh, sometimes grapple with. Um, among others, the book of Daniel from time to time. Uh, the second half of the book of Daniel, which, uh, which I haven't even touched on uh, here, but we'll look at that a little bit uh, later on. Now tonight we'll continue that story when we look at uh, Ezekiel, then Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, and Obadiah. And if time uh, permits, we'll do all of those and then uh, continue our journey through the prophets. In terms of the extra reading, uh, I can only encourage you once again, number one, to read the Bible and to actually take time to read through the prophets and the prophetic literature. literature to read it against the background of the historical situation um, and then to find out more about the historical situation and then to have a bit of a commentary handy. Uh, I, I've said this to you again and again, we just don't have time in our short period together to even go into the detail of these books. Uh, but there are wonderful gems, jewels as I called them earlier on, uh, that, that you will miss unless you ultimately also study these books and, and take a bit of a time to read through them. And, and one thing I want to encourage you to do is, even if you don't study them, even if you just take time to read through them slowly, uh, take a pen and just ask the Lord to lead you, to guide you, and to speak to you. There are so many things that will simply almost be in your face. Uh, much that you won't understand, but there is enough that you will understand that you will be blessed by simply just reading carefully through the prophetic literature. When we get to the prophetic literature, uh, we need to understand them against the, the background of the literary genre, the type of writing material that we find in the prophetic literature. And that is something I want to introduce tonight um, as we continue to journey through the prophets, and more specifically as we look at Ezekiel and Daniel, and then much later we'll look at Zechariah. And this will also provide some back background for those of you who will continue into the next module when we get to the book of Revelation, uh, because we, we're essentially looking at similar kind of prophetic type literature. Now, much of what we have in the prophetic literature, literature as we looked at it last week in Isaiah and in Jeremiah's narrative, 
And that is very easy. In fact, uh, we are tempted sometimes to skip over all the prophetic style and get to the storyline. What, what's the story? So Jeremiah tells us about the fall of Jerusalem. Isaiah tells us about the illness of Hezekiah. Those are narrative uh, stories that, that are easy to read. But we will miss most of what the, prophet, the prophets say unless we uh, have a little bit of an understanding of the poetic style uh, and the prophetic type uh, oracles, as we call them, uh, that we find in the literature there. And I'm not going to repeat all of that, but um, the geographical background, the historical setting, all of those things help us to put the prophet in perspective in historical and geographical uh, context. Now, although large portions of the prophetic literature are poetic, uh, some of what we find and, and part of the, that poetic style is also called apocalyptic material. And uh, many prophets um, use the, uh, or several prophets, I should say, use the apocalyptic style to communicate their message to their own uh, generation. The word apocalyptic is derived from the Greek word uh, apokalypsis, which means a revelation or a disclosure. And the prophet or whoever received this revelation claims that he has received information about the situation that the people found themselves in and can interpret those events in the light of that revelation. And uh, that has come to be known as apocalyptic style. In the 200 years or so before Jesus came uh, to this world, in the intertestamental period, in other words, uh, there was a, um, a heightened activity of apocalyptic material. And it, go it goes all the way into the New Testament era. In fact, the first 100 or 200 years of Christianity saw the publication or the writing of huge amounts of apocalyptic style material. People who claim that they have received some revelation and they can interpret uh, the events that are happening around them or even events that are going to happen somewhere in the future. When we go back to the Old Testament uh, and we go through the Old Testament, we need to understand it primarily as what we will re refer to as either prophetic apocalyptic or apocalyptic prophetic uh, genre. And this is what we find um, in, in the books of Ezekiel, Daniel, and Zechariah, and then, as I said earlier on, the book of Revelation in the New Testament, and there are a few other chapters like Matthew 24, 25, and a few others that, that have some tendencies uh, towards the apocalyptic type style. They, this style differs from the normal prophetic literature in that it claims to provide special insight from the side of God. Um, if you go into uh, the apocalypse, in, into the uh, uh, the apocrypha and the pseudepigraphic books, the extra biblical books, then um, you will find m many, many such examples. But we also have them in the Old Testament and, as I said, in the New Testament. Symbolic material uh, is rife. In other words, speaking in symbols, in pictures, to try and convey some kind of a message became very common, as I said, in the first uh, few centuries, in the last few centuries before Jesus came, and also in the first couple of centuries of Christianity. And there seems to have been some kind of a development um, along this line from the book of Isaiah, where there are a little bit of a reference to this type of style, uh, all the way to Ezekiel, where there's a stronger emphasis on uh, visions and visionary type material. Uh, I see a picture, I see a woman in a basket, or uh, I see a fig tree, um, and, and, the, and there's always some kind of angelic being or a heavenly being uh, that appears to the person and, and then shows out or points out to the prophet some kind of a picture. And then the prophet describes the picture to the angelic being, and then there's some interpretation, uh, not always, but some interpretation given to that. And then in the books of Zechariah, as well as in Daniel, we find large portions of this kind of material. And as I said before, scholars have come to recognize that when you look at the extra-biblical literature, some of them are what we would term pure apocalyptic. But in the, in the Old Testament, you find a combination of apocalyptic and prophetic literature, hence the name prophetic apocalyptic style. Now, when you try and interpret this style of communication, one's got to be very, very, very careful um, because 
they're addressed to people in desperate need. More often than not, apocalyptic style or an apocalyptic book or chapters or communication happened to people, uh, was given to people who were persecuted for their faith. Revelation is a very, very typical example of that. You have Christians who are being persecuted around the world, the, the known world at the time. And they're asking questions about what is happening. And uh, for us, it's very easy to look back 2,000 years ago. But when you're in the middle of a persecution, you, one of the first questions you're going to ask is, okay, so where is God in all of this? I mean, why is this happening to us? We're trying to serve God. What is happening? And the apocalyptic style is helping people who are in the middle, in the midst of a persecution to see spiritually rather than physically what is happening. There is a spiritual reality out there that you need to try and understand. And if you can understand it, then your physical burden will become a lot lighter. Because you're not denying the fact that you're going through persecution, but at least you can understand something of a long-term vision. And, and when you read Revelation, for example, against that background, it, it opens up quite a bit of the book of Revelation because it's interpreting history as it pans out from a God perspective rather than from my human perspective look, looking at my situation. I'm looking down into the human situation from a God perspective. And that is somewhat how you need to understand apocalyptic material. Therefore, some of the uh, characteristics include uh, a vision, um, I've mentioned that already, symbols and symbolic language, either numbers or some items or a tree or a, an angel or even a valley of dead bones in Ezekiel, and uh, the list is endless in terms of the kind of symbols that are used. Uh, conversations with an angelic or a heavenly being, and then there always seems to be some kind of cosmic ca ca catastrophe, a disaster that then leads to the establishment of God's kingdom. And so right now we may be seeing life from our angle. It may look like a disaster, but God is ultimately in control. And that's the message that comes through very clearly in apocalyptic material. The most important thing that we need to bear in mind is that we need to look at the overall picture of apocalyptic material. You cannot get so bogged down by the detail of, of any of that, um, like a woman sitting on seven mountains, for example. Okay, so uh, where, where do we see that picture? Now, it's clearly symbolic language. Uh, I'm using that as an illustration because uh, in, in the same book you have the 666 and how people have tried over the years to find the true meaning behind 666. For example, now we'll deal with that issue when we get to the New Testament eventually. But like the parables, and, and those of you who attended Module 1 will know that when we looked at the rules of interpretation, we call that hermeneutics. One of the things for the parables is we, we don't look at every single detail and ask whether it equates with some truth. We, we rather need to look at the story, and as the story unfolds, so we need to find that one truth that is that the author is trying to convey. In the New Testament case, mostly Jesus. What is that one truth that Jesus is trying to convey through a parable? In that sense, apocalyptic material is not a huge amount different. It's, the, it's a different genre altogether. But it's not a huge amount different in terms of holding on to that one truth. What is the truth that we learn? What is the spiritual truth that is essential behind this? Rather than trying to decipher every single little detail. One thing I have not mentioned to you so far is that uh, in apocalyptic material, symbols often represent something that is, that, that is real. But because of persecution and the fear of persecution and the fear to expose either the Christians or the believers who are persecuted or to refer directly to an enemy, sometimes symbolic language is used. Typically, um, in the New Testament, Rome um, is referred to as Babylon. Um, it's not Babylon, Babylon, but Babylon actually stands for Rome or for the enemy or the enemy of God. Uh, so it picks up a bit of a symbolic type language. Um, and my, my personal interpretation of that would be that, that the number 666 referred to some real individual back then, uh, and it has 
probably spiritual significance and multiple fulfillments in the future as well, uh, and will probably be fulfilled ultimately, but it's not to try and identify in history who that particular person is, because we, we no longer have the key to un unfold that particular riddle, what the actual 666 stand stood for back then, and what it may actually stand for uh, in the future. Now this brings us to the study of our prophetic books in, in uh, our time together today. Our chronology, uh, just to put that map up once again, uh, we are going to look at several of the prophets tonight. Uh, we will look at Hosea, and when we get to Hosea, we are going to really jump around, because we will move from Ezekiel, and you can see Ezekiel uh, in r roughly 593, or maybe 595, uh, slightly earlier, uh, give and take some, some uh, years on e each of these prophets. We are going to look at Daniel. So Daniel and Ezekiel are in a similar time frame. But when we get to the book of Hosea, suddenly we jump all the way back into the 8th century. So 200 years earlier, roughly, uh, once again. Um, and so just hold on to that. Um, Micah and also um, yeah, Hosea was there. So those are the books. And Obadiah, uh, Obadiah is, is over here. Uh, in the latter part of, of our um, Old Testament history once again. So we're going to jump around quite a bit tonight in terms of the timeline, but I want you to hold on to the background, and every time I will introduce the background to you, uh, but do remember we're going to go up and down the timeline, as it were, uh, to try and, and plot these different uh, prophets. Ezekiel. Ezekiel lived during the time of the exile, and he was therefore in exile himself, and he guided the nation that was in exile. Now, let's just get one fact quickly uh, out of the way, and that is, uh, or clear, and that is that not every single Jew was taken into exile. I've said that to you perhaps by implication on a few occasions so far. Mostly the top echelon, the rulers, the nobility, the priests, the landowners, and those kinds of people who would have been taken into captivity. And then there were at least three occasions when the Babylonians came and took people into captivity. Uh, roughly 605, then 597, and then in 586 they came once again, and this time they destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. Ezekiel lives during that same time where some people were taken into captivity. He himself was taken into captivity, but he's still prophesying over Jerusalem back home, as it were, until Jerusalem fell. And then he continued some of his uh, prophetic uh, activity while he was in captivity. Now, Ezekiel reads slightly different from uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah. So if you are reading systematically through the Old Testament, you will read Isaiah first. Uh, typical oracles, there's a bit of historical information about Hezekiah and a few others. Uh, and then the same thing with Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, living through the fall of Jerusalem uh, with oracles and so on. But Ezekiel is slightly different. He, he himself is even a different kind of person. Um, there are many visions that are very similar to what I said before, uh, the apocalyptic material. And one of the key themes um, that we have in the book of Ezekiel is that we will be held responsible for our own actions. The, the temptation was for the exiles to say, well, it's because our forefathers sinned, God is now punishing us. And God is saying, yeah, well, there is a track record. Of course there's a track record. But I have given you opportunity after opportunity to actually repent and I would have come back to you. But you didn't, and I want to let you know that you are personally, individually responsible for your own sins, and therefore you are being punished. So I can't just blame my father because I am uh, being punished for some kind of a sin. And, and that essentially is the issue that Ezekiel is grappling with, because Judah has been punished uh, initially through at least two deportations, and then finally in the, in the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. The prophet Ezekiel uh, is mentioned as a priest, uh, the son of Buzi, a Zadokite priest, but we don't know anything more about the background, and that is very clear 
from Ezekiel chapter 1. Um, and normally this is our starting point, is to go to the first chapter of, of any one of these prophets to see whether they provide us with any information. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, by the Kibar River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was upon him. And then he goes into a vision. But he provides us with just a little bit of historical information about where he was. He was in Babylonia. And also the timing of this particular vision, which looks like the very first vision uh, that he had. He was taken into Babylonian captivity uh, by King Nebuchadnezzar in 597 in that second deportation, along with Jehoiakim, the king, uh, one of the last, uh, uh, one of at least three of, of such occasions, as I mentioned. The, the word or the name Ezekiel means God strengthens, and in a certain sense it became Ezekiel's role. Initially, Ezekiel interpreted the events around the deportations as God's punishing you. Um, you have looked for this, and this is the ultimate result. And then slowly but surely, the tone in Ezekiel starts changing to that of encouragement. Uh, when, when it seems like this is a done deal, um, and now Jerusalem is also destroyed, ultimately, eventually, um, then the tone in, in Ezekiel's pro prophecy start, uh, starts changing to that of more encouragement and looking into the future and restoration uh, of Israel. As far as the writing of the book is concerned, both the style and the language point to one single author. So we may take it as coming mostly from Ezekiel or someone who's writing on his behalf. Uh, the first person is actually used. In other words, I was there, I saw this, and this is what I've done. Um, and it, we, we get the impression that Ezekiel himself was mostly import, uh, uh, responsible for that. Uh, we also have a Jewish tradition that says there that there were uh, prophets in training who sort of gathered around the main prophets and they were the ones who wrote it all up. Uh, probably something like a Baruch, uh, the scribe who wrote down some of the stuff for Jeremiah. We have no real proof of that though. Some of Ezekiel's prophecies are dated, like the one I just mentioned or read. Um, and they were uh, probably known during the time of his life. Uh, or at least shortly thereafter, and the whole book must have been completed and finalized before 562 when uh, Jehoiakim seems to have been released. Jeremiah 52 mentions the fact that Jehoiakim, who was taken into captivity, was sort of elevated to a higher position. He wasn't sent home, but he was released and um, the king actually elevated him and, and invited him and he had his food at the, the palace and so on. That's, that's all we know about that. We don't know anything much more except what Jeremiah writes about that. But Ezekiel doesn't mention that. So we get the impression that the book of Ezekiel and the story of Ezekiel must have come to an end uh, before that. Here is a, a picture of relief uh, from uh, Egypt, which is just an interesting one. And, and over here, there's a soldier heaping up a bunch of hands, literally. Hands cut off part of a battle somewhere. Uh, and um, someone made this particular picture to show how they have uh, conquered the enemy. And they, they, they're making a pile of hands uh, for one reason or the other. There, there are horrible stories in the Bible, I can tell you that. Uh, we, we read about stories of David slaughtering some of the Philistines and doing all sorts of things and cutting off stuff and bringing it to uh, Saul. And, I mean, there are really some very interesting stories in the Bible. But Ezekiel lived and ministered in the days of the kingdom of Judah and during the early days of the exile. And I thought just to refresh our memory, and my memory also needs refreshing, just to go through the last few kings of Judah. We, we're talking Judah over here. Uh, and about 100 years before the fall of Jerusalem, 698 to 644, we had Manasseh followed by Ammon. Both of those kings were completely evil. Uh, you go back into the king's chronicle stories and you will find that they are evaluated as, as having left the road, or left God, and they served other gods. Josiah is the child king who brought a revival. 
and uh, we've, we've encountered him uh, already uh, before. But then he was followed, and that goes all the way to 610. And now we're very close to the Babylonians. In fact, 612 is when the Babylonians took over the Assyrian Empire when they destroyed Nineveh. So by 610, Josiah died. And now, and he dies in a battle with, uh, with the Pharaoh, with uh, the Egyptian army, with a, in a battle against the Egyptians. He is followed for only three months by Jehoiahaz. And then there is Jehoiakim, also called Eliakim, two names for him, 608 to 598. So this is now, now the Babylonians are fully in control. They've already invaded uh, Jerusalem. They've already taken some people into uh, exile. And then they appoint Jehoiakim. He uh, reigns for three months. Then he is taken into exile. And they appoint Zedekiah. And we have encountered Zedekiah in the book of Jeremiah already. It was Zedekiah who had a rebellion against the, um, against the, <coughs> the Babylonians. And then Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Jerusalem as a result of that in 586. Ezekiel's ministry, uh, if you look at this map, gives you a bit of a bigger picture once again all the way from Jerusalem across the, what has become known as the Fertile Crescent, all the way to Babylon on the other side. When Jehoiakim rebelled against the Babylonians, he, he was killed. His son Jehoiakim became king for only three months. And then they entered, the Babylonians entered the city and in 597, which is what Ezekiel refers to, they took Jehoiakim as well as a bunch of other people, including Ezekiel and others, uh, into, act, uh, into captivity. There are about 10,000, according to the Bible, people who were taken into captivity at that particular time. The basic outline of the book, um, I've sort of alluded to this already, but when you read through the book of Ezekiel, and you don't get bogged down by the detail, because the detail will eventually throw you a bit, but when you look at the bigger pictures in Ezekiel, the first 24 chapters um, are loaded with, with visions and imagery that are not always easy to interpret. But one has to read it against the background of Jerusalem still intact, but under the control of the Babylonians, and, and Ezekiel seeing vision upon vision of how God is actually punishing uh, Jerusalem. And uh, inherent in that is a call to repentance, because uh, that's the biblical message. If, if you, and as long as you repent of your sin, God will come and restore you. And so there's always been this hope that God will uh, divert His punishment or His judgment, and therefore keep Jerusalem intact. Now, that did not happen. So ultimately, Jerusalem was destroyed. And so obviously, in the minds of the people was the question, so uh, is God using all these enemies and all these sinful people to come and, and punish His holy nation? And the answer is, yes. Okay, so what's going to happen to them? And Ezekiel kind of answers that question in chapters 25 to 32, when he says, well, God is also ultimately going to come and punish them, because God is in control. And um, several nations are mentioned uh, in those chapters. So from chapter 25 to 32, uh, there are oracles or judgment oracles against those other neighboring nations. And then the tone in Ezekiel, as I mentioned before, changes quite a bit. From chapter 30, 33 onwards, all the way to the end of the book, chapter 48, we have restoration prophecies. And uh, we now get into all sorts of details. Uh, there's, the, um, there, there's that individual responsibility that, that Ezekiel is so strong on, um, but, but ultimately is projecting into the future, and that is that God will ultimately restore Jerusalem and the temple, and more specifically the temple. Now, Ezekiel never saw that. He never saw the temple being restored, but he sees visions, and he's taken in a vision from Babylon, he's taken back to Jerusalem, and he walks the temple, and they have a measuring rod, and they measure out how long and how high and how wide and the rooms of the temple. It's described in, in actually quite a, a, a lot of detail. That particular uh, precise fulfillment, I don't personally believe, ever really uh, became fulfilled, not even with the building of the temple in uh, in, after 538, or with the expansion of the temple under Herod. 
but there are detailed measurements of the restored temple. And again, as I said to you, we can get bogged down by the detail. Okay, so how big is this temple going to be? Is there, ev- is there ever going to be a temple, in fact? I mean, th- those are some of the questions that we need to, uh, that we need to grapple with. Um, I believe that, that Ezekiel's prophecy in terms of the rest- restored temple was, were actually fulfilled. His, his prophecies were fulfilled in the fact that a temple, the second temple, was built and then eventually expand it uh, under the reign of Herod. But now, right now, there is no temple, and so oftentimes we ask this question, uh, is there going to be any kind of fulfillment in, in our future? In other words, with the second coming of Jesus and so on. And then, of course, uh, people have all sorts of different views, such as uh, some people say, yes, the temple in Jerusalem must be restored, and then there are others who say, no, the church is the temple. And, and my body is the temple. And so what we then find in, in Ezekiel in terms of applying it to us is more spiritual application rather than a physical fulfillment of a, a particular building that is going to be completed somewhere. Here's a picture of some of the ancient ruins of the city of Babylon where Ezekiel found himself. Uh, at the time, he was appointed by God as a watchman um, that we find clearly uh, in his book, uh, he even uses that picture of a watchman uh, to point out to Israel her sins, and it's her sins that called her downfall, and that's the first part of the book. In 586, Jerusalem was destroyed, and Ezekiel prophesied now against the other nations, those who caused the downfall of Jerusalem. And then after chapter 33, uh, Ezekiel's task is to to get hope back into the nation, because now they were completely deflated. I mean, at least as long as Jerusalem was there, as long as the temple stood, there was some kind of a hope. We're going to go back, and we're going to serve the Lord, and we have changed, and and so on. Uh, But when Jerusalem got destroyed, um, the people didn't know where to turn. And and they needed to hear the message from an Ezekiel uh, to say, but there is a future, and God will come back uh, for you. When we look at the structure, 13 of Ezekiel's oracles are introduced by a formula referring to the date of the prophecy, similar to the one that I read um, in chapter 1. There are many literary and speech types or sub-genres. Uh, we've, we've encountered them in Isaiah and Jeremiah as well. Judgments, uh, restoration oracles, woe oracles, laments. Uh, we have the whole book of Lamentations as an example of that, but we find in chapter 27 and 32 uh, more examples of that. The prophet used both words and actions uh, to convey his message. And here is an interesting thing, which, we, uh, which seems to be slightly different from that of Isaiah uh, and Jeremiah. Chapter 4, Now, son of man, take a clay tablet, put it in front of you, and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. And then lay a siege to it, erect siege works against it, build a ramp up to it, set up camps against it, and put battering rams around it. Take, and then take an iron pan, place it as an iron wall between you and the city, and turn your face towards it. It will be under siege, and you shall besiege it. Uh, this will be a sign to the house of Israel. And so physically, literally, Ezekiel had to build a city, and then besiege the city. And this was before the destruction of Jerusalem. And so it's, it's like prophetic uh, symbolism, um, acting, acting it out to show to the nation that God is going to cause uh, the city to be uh, besieged uh, and ultimately destroyed. In chapter 12, uh, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, you are living among a rebellious people. They have eyes to see, but they don't, and so on. Therefore, son of man, pack your belongings for exile, and in the daytime, as they watch, set out and go from, from where you are to another place. Perhaps they will understand, though they are a rebellious house. In, in other words, again, with a, with a physical act, he's leaving the community with an exile bag over his back. Whatever that meant, I don't know, but somehow they knew what an exile looked like. And so he was dressing like an exile, he was packing like an exile, and he's saying to the nation, you're going to go into exile. Now, he's in Babylon, of course he is, but, but there's communication back and forth as we, as we get the picture from several of the other books in the Bible uh, that there was communication. So obviously the, the prophecies reached Jerusalem ultimately. 
and the book's development from judgment over Israel, judgment of the nations, and then the restoration of Israel serves to confirm that Yahweh is God uh, and that He is sovereign over all of the nations. A couple of the peculiarities I want to point out, and there's, a, there's plenty of them in uh, Ezekiel. But uh, Ezekiel repeats the words, so that they will know that I am the Lord, L-O-R-D, capital letters. It occurs about 90 times in the book of Ezekiel. And so, it is a confirmation, God is, Yahweh is Lord, Yahweh is God, and they will know that I am the Lord. So, whatever God is doing, whether He is punishing uh, Israel or Judah, or whether He is judging the nations, or whether He is prophesying about the future, they will know that I am the Lord and that I'm in control. The prophet's unusual methods. Uh, there was a time when he had to lie on his one side, literally for days on end, uh, to prove a point. Then he had to turn on the other side, and then he went naked. And I mean, there are all sorts, if you read through the book, there are some wonderful, interesting pictures uh, where he acts out the, the prophecies of God on the nation. And then the ecstatic visions of Ezekiel serve to emphasize a holy and sovereign God who is also gracious, a God of hope who will restore them. And although uh, he's punishing the nation as a whole, God ultimately holds every individual accountable and responsible. We see that in chapter 18, expanded in that whole chapter, beautiful chapter, where it, where it talks about the individual responsibility of every person. Here is a a picture of the uh, Ishtar Gate of Babylon that was built during the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar II, 604, in other words, the time of the fall of Jerusalem, to 562. Ezekiel and others would have seen this kind of picture. The foundations of the gate were discovered between 1899 and 1914, including numerous glazed bricks and unglazed figures. The entire Ishtar Gate was reconstructed to a height of 47 feet, and it now resides at the Pergamum Museum in Berlin. They took it away when they discovered it and re, uh, rebuilt it in Berlin. So, uh, and, and I have had people who went to Germany and to this particular museum and they saw this uh, picture. But um, if, you, if you really look at it, I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful and goes all the way back to two and a half thousand years ago. I believe chapter 2, Ezekiel's call, uh, we didn't have time to read that. Chapter 18 is individual responsibility. 33 is the responsibility of the watchman. Um, and, and there are wonderful messages for all of us in that. Chapter 36, a new heart and a covenant. Uh, that's a prophetic vision for the future. And that is, your heart is calloused, your heart is hard. But God, is, there's going to be a time when this will be taken out and replaced by a heart of flesh. And there will be a new covenant. Uh, we believe that was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. The Valley of Bones. Some of us know the Valley of Bones. Uh, Ezekiel in a vision, he sees uh, just a bunch of bones. And then the bones started coming together. As he speaks, as he prophesies, the bones come together. Then uh, the meat and the sinews and everything. And then they're covered with, with skin. And then they're lifeless. And then the Spirit of God comes upon them. And life comes into a whole army of people. Uh, that's a picture, a vision. And then... Uh, I love the way the book ends. Uh, in fact, the words on, in your notes and on the screen are actually the final words of the book. Um, there is a, there's the gates of the city. Again, it's measurements and size and height and width and all sorts of things uh, about how the city will be built. The distance all around will be 18,000 cubits. And then this word. And the name of the city from that time on will be the Lord is there. And I find wonderful fulfillment in Revelation of that. When we look into the future and we, th we see the new Jerusalem coming and, 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 and being on earth and there is no temple because God is the temple. God is present. And, and that's already way back in Ezekiel. The name of the city is God is there. Um, in fact, one of the things we will pick up on as we go along is that many of the imagery that we find in the book of Revelation are steeped in the Old Testament. So much of what we find in the book of Revelation, you really have to go back into the prophetic literature. In fact, you have to go back into all of the Old Testament. So many of the pictures in Revelation you find back in Genesis, actually, uh, by way of fulfillment, which then, in a certain sense, 
um, frames the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It's one story that is told to us uh, and the, the ultimate fulfillment we find in the book of Revelation. I have referred to Daniel um, in the introduction tonight in the short devotion. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate too much, but slightly earlier, just ever so slightly earlier than Ezekiel, um, but he talks about uh, events that happened all the way from the historical background uh, from 605, that first deportation of Jews uh, to Babylon all the way to uh, the, the Persian Empire taking over under King Cyrus, which is in 538. And that's the time frame for the prophet Daniel. When we look at Daniel, the information in, in chapter 1 that I read earlier on is all that we know about Daniel. He was taken into captivity from Judah in 605. Um, and when you, look, when you go back to Second Chronicles chapter 36, you see that same picture with uh, uh, the king and Daniel and others taken. He was selected to serve the king, and uh, he had special wisdom, uh, which came out even in his young life, uh, but primarily, we believe, because he served God and he stayed in touch with God all along. The uh, background of Daniel, he served four Babylonian kings, and later, as an old man, he ended up in the Persian court. So that's the time frame, the time span from 605 to about 538. Cyrus allowed all exiles to return. We don't get the picture that Daniel returned. He had some room somewhere in the palace by now. He was a very old man, and we don't get the uh, impression that he uh, ever went back. The biggest picture in Daniel is actually the narrative story of Daniel standing his ground. When the going got tough, Daniel stood his ground, whether it was... Um, not bowing to the king or bowing his friends, not bowing to a statue uh, or whatever it was. Daniel served God, and that's the biggest picture we, we have in this book. When it comes to the date of the book of Daniel, there are lots and lots of arguments. I am simply going to introduce that to you only with one single purpose, and that is if ever you pick up books on um, scholarly books on the book of Daniel you will have the different arguments about the date of Daniel, which is either during the time of Daniel or shortly thereafter. And then there, there are those who fast forward the story and say, a person two, three hundred years later actually wrote the book of Daniel. And it wasn't Daniel during the time of Daniel. And that's essentially what you have. The reason for that is that the description of the events that happened in 168 to 164 uh, in Daniel, and, and it's very clear in the visions that Daniel had, that he was talking about uh, the different empires following. It was the Persian Empire overthrown by the Greek Empire. And then you have the story of the, uh, the statue and the, the, the big rock that rolled down the hill and destroyed that statue and the, the feet of clay and it split up into four. It's a very clear picture of the Greek Empire. Alexander the Great, and when Alexander died after just a few short years, uh, his kingdom split up into four different regions with different people ruling and so on. And so the vision in Daniel is a clear description of what happened historically later on. And it's therefore not uncommon for uh, critical scholars, and I want to mention critical scholars especially, to say that Daniel is a pseudonymous, in other words, written in the name of another person type book. Uh, that someone later wrote the book but used the name of Daniel to give it a bit of authority, uh, and so on. And then the author is seen as writing after the event, but projecting as if he is Daniel, and then writing as if Daniel is writing all of that story. Um, some say the spectacular events in Daniel have either not been proved or it's impossible. I mean, how can three people be in a, in a very hot oven and not being burned and uh, in a lion's den and all those kind of stories? And even Nebuchadnezzar's insanity he sees a vision, he has a dream, Daniel interprets the dream, and Nebuchadnezzar ends up eating grass like an animal, and then when he is restored, he acknowledges that king, that God, that Yahweh is the true king. And then the mentioning of Darius the Mede, as opposed to Darius the king of Persia, when you compare Daniel 5.31 with Ezra 4 verse 5, and, and that has never been confirmed. Darius is never mentioned as a Mede outside. Uh, but that is the way outside of the Bible, but that's the way Daniel uh, refers to him. So all of these things have caused uh, 
scholars to say, critical scholars to say, Daniel didn't write it or someone close to Daniel didn't. He didn't see all these visions. A later person saw it. Um, I personally have no problem in believing that God could have worked the miracles. God could have given the revelations to Daniel and that it could be very specific as Daniel saw it. Um, I just wanted to introduce that to you so that you know when you pick up some of the books, you will definitely be introduced to, to that. I don't want you to be shocked uh, when you get to that particular point. Now, here is some information. Uh, on, the, on the background picture, you will see a, a, a cylinder uh, which describes the history, extra-biblical history, the, the history of Babylon, for example. It's a typical picture of that kind of thing. This one is called the Nabonidus Cylinder from Sippar. Uh, is a long text in which King Nabonidus of Babylonia, who ruled from 556 to 539 BC, in other words, just before the Babylonian Empire fell, describes how he repaired three temples, the sanctuary of the moon god Sin in Haran, the sanctuary of the warrior goddess Anunitu in Sippar, and the temple of Shamash in Sippar. But it's almost certainly more significant because it proves the existence of a son named Belshazzar, who is mentioned in the book of Daniel and nowhere else. So that confirms something of uh, the background of Daniel. But here's a, a quote from uh, Wikipedia about Darius the Mede, and not everybody agrees with the, the information. In fact, uh, how the picture actually pans out historically is not 100% certain. But as Darius the Mede is unknown to any other source, many historians view his presence in Daniel as simply a mistake of a much later author, who has perhaps inadvertently placed the Persian king Darius I at an earlier date than he actually reigned. Three key pieces of information seem to support this. Firstly, Darius, like Cyrus, also conquered Babylon. Secondly, Daniel's preference, or uh, sorry, reference to Darius organizing the empire by appointing satraps and administrators. That fits Darius I. And thirdly, Darius I was an important figure in Jewish history, remembered as a king associated with Cyrus, who permitted the returned exiles to rebuild the temple. Be it as it may, there is some historical confusion as to whether Darius was a Persian or a Mede or whatever. Um, but that is just something we need to accept for now. In terms of the kings of Babylon and Persia, uh, here is one of the possible pictures that we may have. That Nebuchadnezzar ruled from 605 to 562. Nabonidus, the one whose cylinder story is up there on the previous slide, 556 to 539. And then note the overlap, because we have co-regents, and that confuses the issue tremendously. You have uh, one who rules in Babylon, but another one who goes and fights a war, but both of them are, kill, are called kings. And so you have a co-regent, someone who holds the fort, while another general goes off and fights a war, and they're both called kings. So it's very difficult to, to distinguish. Then there is Belshazzar, the co-regent with Nabonidus, the last of the kings of the Babylonians. And then Cyrus, the first king of the Persian Empire. And then Darius I is the third king of Persia uh, after that. As I said to you, I have very little problem with um, accepting the book of Daniel. He is fully accepted by the Jewish canon. Uh, he is mentioned in the, in, the, um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have proof of the book of Daniel in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which date from about 100 B.C. The miraculous... Uh, described in the book, I, we have no problem with, and um, all of these, inf all of this information points to an earlier date than the second century, which is what critical scholars would want us to believe. Uh, we believe that it can date from the time of Daniel, or maybe uh, shortly thereafter. Now, before we look at the language and the contents of Daniel, we're going to take a tea break. Right, um, let's look at the language and the contents of Daniel. Uh, in terms of the language, uh, we, we talked about this in Module 1, especially the whole of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. But in Daniel, we, and also in the book of Ezra, we have um, those couple of exceptions that we have in the Old Testament. Part of Daniel is written in Aramaic, a, a related language, um, but probably reflecting the fact that, that Daniel was living in a foreign environment and that most of the, the people then 
they started speaking Aramaic, and certainly the people uh, of other nations, like the Babylonians and others, would understand Aramaic and not Hebrew. But there are clearly two sections in the book of Daniel. The first one I've mentioned already earlier on is the narrative section, chapters 1 to 6. This is where we find uh, Daniel, he's calling, um, going to the palace, uh, lion's den, the fiery furnace, and all those stories in the book of Daniel. And then chapter 7 to 12, we have Daniel's visions, mainly describing events that would take place in the future. And uh, this is one of those occasions where prophetic literature takes on a future element, uh, which we referred to last week as, uh, or the week before or last week, uh, either as foretelling uh, or forthtelling. Now, in this particular case in Daniel, you will certainly find a lot of forthtelling because it projected into uh, the future events that were going to follow. Uh, on this stone that you see on the screen in that photograph, we have a Babylonian chronicle that um, refers to the year 605 to 595, um, and you can read more about that on BibleArchaeology.org, uh, which, which is where I found this particular photo. In terms of outline, the training in Babylon, we've referred to that already in chapter 1. Chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, uh, which was then interpreted by Daniel. And then the golden image and the friends who refused to bow to the image and they were thrown in the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar's pride and his punishment, as I said, not described anywhere else, but uh, you eventually find Nebuchadnezzar on his knees eating grass, going completely uh, wonky. Uh, but then he, he comes right once again and he's... he's uh, reinstituted as the king. In chapter 5, we have Belshazzar's presumption and punishment. Uh, we know it better as the story of the writing on the wall, uh, where uh, Belshazzar calls for the, uh, the uh, goblets from the, from the Jerusalem temple to be brought, and they made all sorts of fun of it, and the writing is on the wall, which essentially said to him that the end is there. We have a decree by uh, Darius in chapter 6, and then in chapter 7, 8, 9, uh, uh, all the way to 12, we have visions of the beasts and the empires. Those things were, if you read them carefully, uh, virtually uh, fulfilled in, as the history panned out in the years, in the hundreds, a few hundred years following Daniel. Uh, if you want to do yourself a favor, read chapter 9. This is Daniel reading carefully uh, from the book of Jeremiah, finding that uh, the uh, Babylonian exile will, will last for about 70 years. And we have Daniel's prayer. It's a prayer of confession and a prayer of intercession, asking the Lord that the exile will actually come to an end. It's a beautiful chapter. You've got to read that. And then we have more prophecies uh, around the end times uh, in the book of Daniel. I, can, uh, I don't want to get into this uh, for now, uh, but both in, the books of, both in the book of Ezekiel as well as in the book of Daniel, we have imagery used that oftentimes uh, people who feel strongly about our end times, the, coming of the second coming of Jesus, where they try and piece some of those pictures together. Uh, what kind of war will take place, how, it, how long it will take place, where it will happen, etc., etc. Uh, the Gog and the Magog and... Uh, beasts and imagery or image in the temple and the list goes on and on and on and uh, oftentimes I just want to give up and say you know living a uh, just a simple life is probably easier otherwise you get drawn into the kind of prophecies about exactly when Jesus is going to come back like a particular date that is prophesied etc etc uh, which I personally don't believe can happen in terms of the structure um, there are scholars who uh, who do a lot more research than I can even do, uh, than I even have the ability to do, but they see some similarities between the first part and the second part of the book, where chapters 1 and 6, for example, will be Daniel who refuses to comply with foreign religious demands. In chapter 1, it's the eating of food. In chapter 6, it is not worshipping the king. Uh, where there's a color, cor corollary between chapter 2 and 7, again, where there are four empires. It's an interesting uh, comparison. And so you can go on chapter 3 and 8, where human kings demand to be worshipped, um, and, and so on and so on. Um, that's uh, for those who are definitely um, more, who are sharper in terms of looking at the structure of a language and how a book is being uh, put together. 
some of the themes that we find in Daniel. Uh, obviously, the control of God. In fact, this is a theme that we will find again and again and again in the prophetic literature. Almost every time uh, I try and do a summary of the book right at the end, this is up front. And that is God is in control or God is sovereign. God rules over the nations. Here you have Israel in captivity and yet God is in control. He controls Nebuchadnezzar. He controls Belshazzar. Um, he provides for Daniel uh, and then uh, he assists Daniel in, in a Gentile attack. He protects the friends in the fire. God is acknowledged even by Nebuchadnezzar. He is glorified and ultimately God will bring the Son of Man. Um, you have that concept, son of man, in Ezekiel. We actually read that in Ezekiel chapter 1, where Ezekiel is called son of man. And son of man can be a normal expression like human being. You, you a son of mankind. In other words, you, you're just a human being. But in Daniel, we seem to have a reference to son of man, which is more prophetic. And uh, when we look back, we obviously believe that uh, that is prophetic uh, in terms of Jesus. I need to remind you, and let me just do this on the board once again. Um, I, I, I showed you a little picture last week. There, there's several questions when you read prophetic literature. The one question is, what did Daniel say to his own time? Um, let's say Daniel lives about 600. What, what did Daniel say uh, to his own time and the people living in his own time? The second thing you need to ask is, what did Daniel say about Jesus Christ? Uh, and, and how is prophetic literature fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ? And oftentimes, there will be one single fulfillment or one single application, and that is for the prophet during the prophet's time. We'll see lots of that in the prophetic literature, where the only application is for the time of the prophet. Then there are other prophecies where you have to say, like the Son of Man, uh, and so on, where there is a future fulfillment, most of those referring to Jesus Christ. Uh, last time I gave you just one third uh, circle, and that is how this will be fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. But I want to add another circle in between, and that is 2011 or 2012 or whenever we live in our day and time, in the, let's say, the 21st century. What, what does that book say? What, is it, what does the prophecy say to me in my situation right now? Um, it certainly said something to the time of the prophet. Some of that, and most of that, much of that uh, was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. But obviously there is an application to my own life. And only then really, to some extent, do we ask the question, about the second coming, and that is when Jesus will come back again. Does that prophecy say anything about those future events? Now, the one, the one word, the one concept that I've used uh, on a few occasions now is what I refer to as multiple fulfillments. Um, so any prophet or prophecy in the Old Testament may have multiple fulfillments, and we can look at that sometimes... Um, there may be only one single fulfillment, and that's either in the time of the prophet or at the coming of Jesus, or even it's just a, re a reference to the second coming. Um, and, and it doesn't make in interpreting the prophets necessarily easier, but it's good to hold on to that concept of multiple fulfillments. Another theme we find in the book of Daniel is that human pride leads to downfall um, and serving God. In fact, it's a theme that we find in Daniel, and serving God is the only thing, serving God humbly is the only thing that will keep us going. When Nebuchadnezzar uh, put himself up against God, he believed that he was God. Um, I just read in uh, the Proverbs, I think it was yesterday morning, Proverbs 18, verse 12, pride becomes bef comes before for the fall. Some, or some uh, word like that, I may be uh, paraphrasing it, but pride comes before fall. Um, and when we put ourselves on the throne, then we're about to fall. It is when we uh, bow before God that God will elevate us. The message of Daniel um, is that God is in control. There was an expectation among the exiles that the, uh, that the time of the uh, exile will come to an end. And uh, when you read in the book of Daniel, there's 70 years, um, and this is part of the difficulty of Daniel. 
Uh, the exiles believe that 70 years and then everything will be honky-dory. But Daniel looks further into the future and the 70 years actually become 70 weeks of years. And so you need to look at it as 70 times 7 uh, years. So it becomes 490 years. And when you read through Daniel and some of those visions and prophecies actually project literally hundreds of years into the future, some of which then, as I said uh, earlier on, uh, some of those things were literally fulfilled uh, in the coming of those different empires as one empire was replaced by another, all the way to the Greek empire uh, and so on. And so that, that's how Daniel looks at uh, the history uh, that was going to come uh, for him. Daniel in the future, I, I think I've said a lot about this, but Daniel provides very specific details about future kingdoms, uh, which were literally fulfilled during the intertestamental period. The Gospels, however, applied Daniel's reference to a son of man uh, to Jesus Christ. And so Jesus took that title upon himself, and that's the way the Gospel authors refer to Jesus as the son of man. Much of the language and the image or imagery in Daniel is repeated or alluded to in the book of Revelation, um, and that you find um, uh, again and again in the book of Daniel. But some of the image, images we find in Revelation also go to the rest uh, of the Old Testament as well. I give you some passages to read. Um, if you really want to appreciate the book of Daniel, the first six chapters will tell you the story, uh, which is uh, very close to what we have been taught in Sunday school. Those who grew up in Sunday school will know at least the story of the lion's den, uh, perhaps, and the fiery furnace. Those two will probably stand out, but there's a lot more uh, in those chapters. And then in chapter 9, the, the others are visions, and they are, as I said, fairly difficult to interpret, and therefore also fairly difficult to say, okay, Lord, what are you saying to me personally? You may find a verse or a concept there that will speak to you personally, but by and large, I think chapters 1, 3, 5, 6, and Definitely chapter 9, the prayer of Daniel, will be of, of much value to you when you read them uh, from a personal angle. Now, that concludes the four major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. We're now going to go into the last 12 of the prophetic books in the Old Testament, and they are referred to as the Minor Prophets. Um, and this title refers to the fact that they are shorter and therefore they were written on one single scroll. And I mentioned this to you before, but they were, ref or they are referred to in the Jewish canon as simply the twelve. Uh, and it's one single scroll. So when you make a comparison between the Old Testament that we have and the Hebrew Bible that they still read till today, it is exactly the same thing. But their books are fewer. They have fewer names of books. This is one reason, because they write 12 of them under one title. And then in that scroll, each one of them will obviously have the title of the uh, prophetic, of, of the prophet. In terms of chronology uh, of the prophets, uh, I want to put this up for you. I'm not sure that you have this in your notes, but uh, we have, if you look at it chronologically, uh, then you have Joel, um, when we look at Joel a bit later on, I will highlight the fact that my personal view is that Joel wrote later rather or lived later rather than earlier. But we have no indication in the, in the book itself as to a date, no name or anything that, that gives us an idea. But then as Amos, probably about 760, and Jonah, who would have lived roughly the same time. Hosea, 760 all the way to 722. So all of these are in the, in the 8th century. Micah, a contemporary of Hosea, uh, 742 to 678. And then Isaiah, 740 to 700. So you can see that many of these are actually contemporaries. And they may and probably did know of each other or even knew each other. And then Nahum, 664 to 612. That's around the fall of Nineveh. Uh, and that's how we date him. Zephaniah, 640 to 609. So we're now getting closer to the time of the exile. And then Jeremiah um, and Habakkuk, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Obadiah. All of them are around the fall of Jerusalem and the Babylonian Empire. And then we get to Haggai and Zechariah, and they are uh, way beyond the return of the exiles. In other words, we're now talking the Persian uh, era as well. 
And um, I personally think that Joel really should fit in here. Uh, that's why I give him two, two dates and scholars are just not exactly sure when. And then Malachi would, would fit into that last uh, bit as well. Lead us to the book of Hosea. Hosea speaks to the nation of Israel, uh, that is the northern kingdom, during the time of Jeroboam II. And uh, we go to the beginning of Hosea. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Johash, king of Israel. So, here we are after Daniel, and we now wind the clock back again. So, we go back to the 8th century, uh, 760 to 722, and this is what makes reading systematically uh, through the Old Testament difficult, because you jump around on that uh, timeline. Looking at the background of Hosea, he gives us the background that he spoke to the northern kingdom. He began his reign during the reign of Jeroboam II. This was an era of uh, major advance, a golden era for the northern kingdom. It is probably one of the best times for the northern kingdom, although they started very badly um, and they ended on a, on a terrible and tragic note. But right here in the middle somewhere, there's a little bit of a highlight and a bit of a ray of hope uh, because Jeroboam, although he himself did not necessarily serve God, uh, he was irresponsible, politically speaking, uh, to really establish Israel, the northern kingdom, into a, f uh, a fairly large territory and so on. But after Jeroboam II, there was a, a definite downward spiral uh, culminating in 722 in the defeat of Samaria by the Assyrians. So as we wind back, back the clock, we're now not in the Babylonian era, we're in the Assyrian era. Uh, so that's, that's the background picture that you need to bear uh, in mind. In terms of the prophet himself, Hosea is the same root as the word Joshua, which ultimately in Greek is the word Jesus. And it's, uh, the word means salvation or God saves uh, or something like that. And whether that is significant or not, um, oftentimes babies were given a name. And whether they then live up to the name, um, we, we don't always know. Um, and sometimes a name is given to a person that has absolute significance and the name is changed halfway through. Like that of uh, Joshua, we, we talked about that uh, when we looked at the book of Joshua. But God's instruction to the prophet to marry an adulterous wife is an interesting one. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day, I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhamah, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to the house of Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but by the Lord their God. And then after she had weaned law, hurama, law means negative, no or not. Uh, by the way, you can read the bottom there. It says law means not loved. Law, uh, ruhama means not loved. And then there was another son. Then the Lord said, called him law ami. And am, am is the word for people and the me at the end is my. And law means not. So it says not my people. And um, so the poor children were given names to try and prophesy to the nation of Israel to tell them that God has basically decided to punish them and to judge them. Uh, apart from what we are told in the book, we don't know anything more uh, about Hosea as a prophet, er, as, a, as a person. Uh, in terms of the northern kingdom, uh, Jeroboam I started, as we know, about 931 after they broke away from, uh, uh, from Judah. Uh, started on shaky grounds, building two shrines with uh, idols in them or images in them of a calf where Jeroboam said, this is your God, and that's how people started worshipping. 
And then Jeroboam the second um, is the twelfth king, was the twelfth king after Jeroboam the first. And he reigned for a long time, from 788 to 753, and was able to lead Israel into becoming a relatively wealthy and powerful regional force uh, in enmity against Judah. They, they didn't like Judah, and we'll pick that up again when we look at the book of Amos uh, a bit later on. And it seems that, like, that the prosperity that they enjoyed led them to take their focus even more away from God. There was always an awareness of God. Always God was there. God spoke to them. God sent them many prophets like Hosea. But unfortunately, they didn't continue to serve God. And uh, despite the success that they had, it seems like there was poverty in the land, uh, a, a huge disparity between the rich, the, the king and his people, uh, exploiting the poor, social conditions were bad, and certainly they didn't follow the Lord the way that they should have. And then God uses this metaphor of marriage in the life of Hosea. Uh, one can go on and on and argue about this particular marriage, but essentially Hosea is sent into the streets to go and find a harlot, uh, a, a lady who is selling herself, and he's got to take her in as his wife. Now, she eventually is not faithful to Hosea, her husband. And uh, God uses that as a picture to say, I am your husband, and Israel, you are my wife, but you're like a harlot. You're running after every other god. Uh, and, and that's essentially the message that poor Hosea, with his physical marriage life, needed to live out and use that as an example and saying, like my experience, this is God's experience uh, with the nation of Israel. The situation after Jeroboam quickly uh, deteriorated, Jeroboam the second. Um, and, and one sample of that is like four of the last kings were murdered. So the one after the other. Uh, and it, le it led to the Assyrian army coming in in 722 and destroying uh, Samaria. Over here on the screen we have a picture of a fragment, a manuscript. If you've been in Module 1, then I talked about textual criticism and manuscripts and fragments and all sorts of things. And over here we have a fragment from a Dead Sea Scroll. Uh, this text is a commentary or a pesher on the prophetic biblical verses from the book of Hosea, chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. The verse presented here refers to the relation of God, the husband to Israel, the unfaithful wife. Uh, just proof that uh, way back in a hundred, at least a hundred be before Christ, uh, already the book of Hosea was studied uh, by that particular community. Two main sections that we find in the book of Hosea. The one is chapters 1 to 3 where Hosea's marriage to Gomer and their stormy relationship is described symbolizing Israel's unfaithfulness. And then chapters 4 to 10, the second half, uh, is Hosea's message addressing Israel's unfaithfulness and God's judgment. But also the book of Hosea has been called the book of love because of God's love for his people reaching out to his wife his unfaithful wife. It, it talks about the grace of God, giving, giving Israel chance after chance after chance to come back to him. And, and that is described in the book of Hosea uh, in the next couple of chapters where Hosea had to go after his wife to get her back again. Some scholars even believe that there may have been a second marriage uh, when she left him or even another wife that Hosea had to take in. Uh, it, it seems to be slightly uncertain as to exactly what happened. But but the concept and the imagery, the image of, of a marriage, uh, a wedding where God loves his nation. Uh, and Israel therefore can never say, well, God turned his back on us. Uh, God is the, is the cause that we are where we are or that they were where they, where they eventually ended up. Uh, because God reached out to them in a loving marriage covenant. Uh, and that's part of the undergirding message of the book of Hosea. God loves Israel. And he gives them a chance to come back to him. And it's Israel who turned her back on God. Um, and that is played out, physically played out by Hosea and his marriage with Gomer. Um, I've said this already, but Hosea focused on the north. And it's sometimes referred to not only as Israel, but also as Ephraim. So when you read the word Ephraim in, in Hosea, it means the north. He does refer to the south, as we have seen already, but um, it, his message, his, his focus is on the north. Um, and then Gomer's unfaithfulness to her husband is a picture of, or a type of Israel's unfaithfulness. Uh, and love, rejected love. Uh, 
That's the, the picture or the message of the book of Hosea. I said to you already that scholars are not all in agreement exactly what happened. You have that one marriage or wedding referred to, but there's another one referred to in chapter 3. It says, The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer of a lethic of barley. And I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with another man or with any man. And I will live with you. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod uh, or idol. And so, again, poor Hosea had to go out there, get a prostitute. Whether it's Gomer or another one, it's uncertain had to pay money either to get his own wife back or to buy another one and to marry this purely to illustrate to Israel once again her major unfaithfulness uh, to God. Now when it comes to marriage, we, we learn a few little lessons here, albeit by way of illustration, uh, mainly from a negative point of view, but both Jews and Christians have a biblical, uh, conservative, biblically conservative approach to marriage. Hosea's marriage to Gomer would have raised eyebrows even today. I mean, if, if your pastor is told to go into the red light district of Hillbrow and go get a wife for himself, I'm sure the elders will have a meeting tomorrow uh, to try and talk about that very quickly. Uh, and, and, but, but that's the way you need to see this. It, this was shocking. It was absolutely shocking that a man of God, a prophet of God, would go and find himself a prostitute and then marry her by command of God. And, I mean, nobody would believe him if he told them, God told me to do this. But we can so focus on the actual command and whether God said it and how he can say that, that we lose the point. The point is, God loved Israel and he's using shock tactics to speak to his nation, to say, as Hosea married a prostitute, you are a prostitute and you have prostituted yourselves to other gods. And I'm calling you back because I love you. And as Hosea had to go after his wife when she left him, so the God has come after them uh, to love them and to bring them back from the idols that they brought in. We learn a lot um, in, the, in the narrative sections, the historical sections about Baal, the Baal prophets. Uh, in Kings chapter 18, for example, Elijah and the Baal prophets. Uh, and, and over here we have a prophetic description constantly referring to the fact that Israel has gone after the Baals or Baal. Um, and, and this was one of the major problems uh, with Israel. When they moved into the land, uh, we talked about this already in the book of Joshua, they were supposed to annihilate, to destroy completely the nations before them with all of their gods and everything. They didn't do it. And so these nations became a major stumbling block, uh, uh, luring Israel into worshipping uh, in their way, and uh, therefore adopting the Canaanite and the heathen practices. Their sin included Baal worship, something that features very strongly in the book of Hosea. Baal was one of many gods worshipped by the nations around. He was seen as the son of El, and El is a short for Elohim, which is God. And I mentioned that to you before, it's a generic word for God, but sometimes it refers specifically to the God of the Old Testament, but in this case it doesn't. But El and Asherah, two gods, had a relationship, and their son, out of that relationship, was Baal, and he was seen as the rain and storm god. Uh, hence the whole picture on, uh, on Mount Carmel trying to plead with Baal to bring rain after the drought. Uh, but Baal was uh, worshipped worship and aided in his struggle against his rival uh, who was mocked uh, by offering human sacrifices and ritual prostitution. In other words, if you go to the temple of Baal, you can have sex with one of the prostitutes there, either male or female, uh, and that would aid you in your worship of God. Now, you can see how totally, totally distorted it becomes. Uh, and even human offerings or sacrifices to Baal to appease him and, and to plead with him to see you and to help you and so forth. Um, and it was a totally sick religion, and Israel got drawn into that. And um, 
when you then read Hosea against this kind of background, the fact that God says to Hosea, go and marry a prostitute, I want to make a point because that is what Israel has done. Israel has become a prostitute and I want to make the point. There's always an opportunity. Go and buy her back. Um, and there's always an opportunity for Israel to come back. Ultimately, we know Israel didn't come back, uh, and therefore God's punishment was on them. Some of the passages, Hosea's wife and children in the first uh, chapter. Chapter 3, Hosea buys back his wife. Chapter 4, God's accusation uh, against Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There's only cursing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. And so the list goes on. And then God's love for Israel. This is probably one of the most beautiful pictures. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals. And they burned incense to images. It was I who, bought, who taught Ephraim to walk, talking, uh, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize that it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. I mean, when you read that story, it's like God was saying, I love you so much, I have done so much for you. And yet you turn your back on me. So that, that's the story that we find in Hosea. And then the call to repentance in chapter 14. I encourage you to go and read that uh, on your own. The book of Joel, where God uses a disaster. We believe it, uh, it to be a, a locust plague to speak to Judah through his prophet. And um, now we have two possible time slots, either uh, as early starting in the 9th century, perhaps even, uh, all the way to the 8th century, but it can also be, and I believe it to be, much later, like in the 6th uh, century. When you go to the book of Joel, it simply says in chapter 1, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Petuel. Hear this, you elders, listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell it to your children, and let the, your children tell it to their children, and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. And it's one word upon another, referring to different swarms of locusts who come into the land and literally chowing up the land completely. Um, and that's the background to the book of Joel. The date is not given, no further information. But the book is probably best known for the quote by the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, when he refers to chapter 2, verse 28 and further, um, where he talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And afterwards, I will pour out my Spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. And Peter quotes that uh, verbatim when he speaks on the day of Pentecost to say what you have seen to the, to the crowd out there. He said what you have seen and heard is the fulfillment of what the prophet Joel said. Uh, and then he quotes from chapter 2 verse 28. The book has an interesting message again, the background of a disaster that struck them. And it seems to be this locust plague. And in terms of the background, and when you look at this, this picture over here, uh, this, is a, this is a photograph of a locust plague. It's obviously a, a more modern one, so it doesn't go back to the book of Joel. Uh, but locust plague, this is a picture of a locust plague in South Israel, November 2004. A lot of residents reported clouds of locusts eating palm trees bare and wiping out entire gardens. I mean... 2004. We're not even talking about years and years uh, ago. Um, and, and that seems to be um, the, the background where a locust plague come and devastated the land, which is uh, fairly common uh, in those days. Now, it doesn't happen every year, but it is common. And the, pro the prophet then interprets that as an event uh, that, that uh, should point in the direction of God's judgment on the nation. 
so you have a natural disaster interpreted by the prophet as God judging the nation. We often ask that same question when there's a disaster. Is God speaking or what is God saying? I'm very careful not to come to a one-on-one -on -one conclusion that every time there's a disaster like uh, the, uh, the tsunamis that hit uh, some of the uh, Asian countries and, and Japan more recently, I'm very careful to say God is judging them. But one should be asking the question, what is God saying in a situation like that? And that seems to be what Joel is doing, except that Joel is saying God is punishing us because we have sinned against him. And locust plagues were, back in those days, uh, regular occurrences in many countries around the world. Uh, and even till today, it's very, very difficult to predict them. In the uh, Karua, for example, uh, or in the Kalahari, oftentimes, after years of nothing, um, and suddenly, uh, it seems like they germinate and they just, they just come. And even with all the modern equipment nowadays, it's, it's not possible, number one, to predict it sometimes. And, and it's very, very difficult to control them, even with modern day uh, equipment. And when, when those locusts come, they, they literally just sweep across um, the land like a plague. And that's what happened to Pharaoh and, and Egypt uh, during the time of the Exodus. The writing of Joel... Uh, as I said, the most challenging issue for us is the date because we don't know and the time and the, the focus of the prophet. Um, but it can date from any time um, in those years. When we do try and date the book, there are a couple of indications. He talks about elders in chapter 1, verse 2. And he says, hear this, you elders. Now, that may be a reference to an allusion to the fact that there is no king at the time. So it either predates the time of the king, otherwise the prophet would speak to the king, um, either David, Solomon, or whoever it was, or there is no more a king. And that would mean sort of after the exile, or around the exile, or after the exile. Um, but that can also refer to any other time. There may have been a king, but the prophet is simply addressing the elders of the nation. And then there's a reference to the scattering in chapter 3, verse 2. I don't want to read all these verses to, to try and save some time, but you can read that. There is a, no reference to Assyria or Babylon. There is a reference to the Greeks in chapter, six, uh, chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, it says, You sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks, that you might send them far from their homeland. Now that's an interesting reference. And whether Greek is here a, a broad generic term, for Gentile, or whether it refers to the Greek, the Greeks themselves, we don't know. Uh, but that would certainly indicate a later rather than an earlier date. And then it predicts the destruction of Edom in chapter 3, verse 19, pointing to a later date, but not before Edom was invaded by, the, uh, by some Arab nations uh, in the 5th century before Christ. The message... Joel's reference to and description of the day of the Lord helps us, and we'll begin to pick that up again and again now, where there's reference to the day of the Lord. And this day of the Lord works really like the fulfillments that I already explained to you, and that is, you have the day of the Lord. Here you have a locust plague, and Joel says, it's the day of the Lord. The Lord is judging us. This is the day of the Lord. But then the day of the Lord also came when Jesus came to this world. The day of the Lord may be my day. But the day of the Lord, we also know from the New Testament, is referred to as the second coming and the judgment that will come. So there is no clearer indication of multiple fulfillments than you actually have here in the book of Joel, knowing that the day of the Lord, prophetically speaking, uh, referred to, to Joel, and in his case, even a historical event, something that happened before his time. But then also for us, we know that there is also going to be another day of the Lord that will come somewhere in the future. Joel had an emphasis both on judgment and a call to repentance, uh, calling people to repent. He says, if you understand anything about this disaster, it helps us. It's not only the judgment of God, but it's also a call to repent. If you repent, then the Lord will come back for you. Uh, and then it seems like in chapter 2, verse 18, there was a positive response by the nation to his message. Um, and, and in verse 19, there is a change. Uh, Verse 18, it says, Then the Lord will be jealous for, the, for his land and take pity on his people. The Lord will reply to them, I'm sending you grain, new wine and oil. So from 
total judgment in the first section, there is now a change to more promise uh, that God will come back and God will be there for them. As long as they repent, uh, then the God will restore them. In terms of the contents and the structure of Joel, Joel's prophecies are organized in two cycles. One contemporary, that's the present, and the other one is eschatological, meaning the future. Uh, for Joel, it's somewhere in the future God will bring restoration. The contemporary oracle came as a direct result of the plague, the locust plague, and the judgment. And the second oracle was prompted by a positive response, it seems like, where people uh, repented, or at least they heard the message of Joel, and they were willing to, uh, to turn back to him. In terms of an outline of Joel, the locust plague, in uh, chapter 1, the fruits of repentance, the gift of the Spirit, I've referred to that already, um, and when we get to the New Testament, we'll pick that up again. Um, something we celebrate on, on the day of Pentecost, and then God's enemies are judged in chapter 3, and a restoration is promised in chapter 3, uh, verse 17. Maybe a couple of extracts from that. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day the mountains will drip new wine, and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias and so on. Some of the themes, natural disasters uh, at times can point to God's act of judgment or punishment. We should not always make that connection, but that is certainly a possibility that one should consider. And then Joel's message impacted not only his own, but also that of the New Testament, as we can see from the quote on the day of Pentecost. And uh, Peter's use of Joel sends a message to us because Peter also emphasized repentance. He said, this is what you saw, and if you repent, if you turn from your sin, then the Lord will bless you. And this gift of the Holy Spirit will be yours and your children and for the next generation. So repentance is a, is a theme that we find uh, in the book of Joel. I can only encourage you to read uh, those passages that I list in the notes uh, so that you can pick up on that. I'll bring um, our lecture time to a close with that, and I've got some more work to do next time when we pick up on the book of Amos and Obadiah, uh, and then we'll go through the rest of the prophetic literature. Thank you for coming, and may the Lord bless you.